Actually, I had that in another slide, but I didn't. I cut it out. Yes. So, um, look, uh, Donna's mentioned that uh, the, the it, look. Uh, first of all, law is a fact of life. You can't you can't launch anything unless you go through um, the Australian government. <laughs> Mark is here. He's going to talk to uh, to you guys about what's uh, what's happening with the reform. But um, uh, so we hit that um, wall when we start. Even when we started the the project, remember I, I said in an earlier presentation that uh, the project started in 2012. Uh, we got the approval, and you know, with the letter of uh, of acceptance came a set of legal requirements, including signing the contract, which uh, both. Both of us, uh, our institutions have done, um, and I remember we went to the 2013 CubeSat uh, um, symposium, which was organised by uh, QB50 symposiums, organised by VKI, and it was an eye opener for from the legal side. Uh, you know, uh, we we got there and we we knew that we had to get uh, insurance, but VKI's understanding was not very good. Our own understanding was not very good. And the laws between the two uh, countries were not the same. So it was a very, very interesting experience. I'll, I'll uh, mention more about it in a, in a second. But from there, we, we came back uh, uh, to Sydney. And then you know, this is when you guys got involved. So. Yes, it was in April 2014 when uh, the Space Licensing Safety Office LASSO uh, convened a meeting at Sydney University. And uh, basically, it was intru to introduce us to how the, the Australian government uh, treats those international treaties that, that Elias has up on, on, on screen and what are the implications to the Australian regulatory system. And essentially, um, it's because of these international treaties that uh, imposes potential liability on the Australian government if an Australian citizen uh, uh, launches a space object, and so the Space Activities Act, which was passed in 1998, and the regulations under it are designed in order for the Australian government to pass on some of that liability to the uh, Australian citizens, including the universities, and there were three universities uh, in 2014 uh, who attended that meeting, um, and, uh, and SLASO indicated that the insurance requirements were a very important part of, uh, of seeking regulatory approval. Uh, but Helen um, uh, also uh, worked a lot with SLASO in order to find out um, exactly what were the requirements that we had to meet on the insurance and liability front. Yes, yeah, SLASO's approach to a research institution seemed to have changed Sydney University started working on another project in 2011 and it seemed that we were not going to be able to move forward without insurance So for that project. So um, that made the spend on that redundant and lost money because we won't be able to go to fund the insurance premiums. So we started working very closely with Slazo to work out what their level of um, comfort would be. And a lot of the background information that we provided about the launching site, the launch vehicles, and we've had numerous launch vehicles in mind, launch locations, um, we've done MPL calculations, as many of you in the room who were involved in MPL calculations will be aware, and um, the pro risk profile of the various um, um, CubeSats, um, calculations about burn up and risk profiles of um, actual um, you know, impact on Earth uh, or in the atmosphere with certain things. So a lot of information was provided to SLAZO about risk and I can only um, applaud SLAZO for the amount of um, time um, that they worked very closely with um, this whole team, with Ty and myself and with Sandra Lilburn at University of Adelaide and Matt Tetlow um, to put together enough information so that they were able to exempt us from the insurance requirements and also um, to have that level of, of confidence about the amount of information that we could cut out at. So we, um, that was quite time consuming. Um, the other thing that um, 
I'll draw attention to while Mark is here is that the new legislative provisions that are currently under discussion as proposals don't anticipate an overall exemption for research institutions from either <coughs> insurance requirements or financial requirements in this set of proposals, but um, we're confident that from the comments that we've seen in the proposal document that we'll be able to move to some other accommodation about tiered liability. Um, and um, those were the major hurdles that we needed to um, get through getting accurate information, the quantity of information and um, looking at what our actual insurance costs would be and actually buying an insurer. If you did have to get insurance, it's really hard to find an insurer who will cover you. So those are the major practical things that emerge from it. But I think Mark knows our telephone numbers off by heart and he's, he's worked for such a long time with us as has Alex. So. Um. I want to say something that uh, I mentioned that when we went to the um, when I went to the CubeSat workshop at the beginning, it was a um, big eye opener. I think to set the context for those of you who don't know why we've we've had these issues, this this slide this basically illustrates what we what we had to deal with. So we've got Australia is um, uh, is party to, to a bunch of treaties under the United Nations <coughs> and. Um, that actually puts obligations on the Australian government. Now, international space law, which is the sum of these treaties plus other, other instruments, um, basically relates government to government. It doesn't talk about us as, as a university or individuals. So, um, th what this means is that the Australian government has responsibilities to other governments and, um, and is bound for, to provide comp compensation and so forth. Now, when, when we went to, um, uh, to VKI and we sat down, so VKI came back to us. We, you know, Donna mentioned that you get your name on the, on the um, uh, launch certificate. The unique thing about this, and this is something that I, uh, at, at the time, and th this is something that I think will be more of the rule than the exception with small satellites, is that we did, did not have access to the launch provider. When you have access to the launch provider, when, you've, when you're the primary customer and your satellite is you know, a uh, $200 million satellite is what's, what's going up there. You're talking to the launch provider. You go to the launch provider and you say, you can write my name on, you, you must write my name and my government's name on the, the launch certificate. Uh, when you look at the relationship, I've got this in another slide. So we were, these three Australian teams, um, our relationship was, was with, the, um, with Belgium. Their relationship, um, was with the launch provider, uh, was with the launch provider, which is Nanorax, whose relationship is with uh, NASA, whose relationship is with GearWay. So, you know, try and, try and get somebody. We, we tried. Helen? Yeah, um, we negotiated a lot with BKI just to even look at the liability provisions and the insurance provisions in the contract, and that was any possibility. I tried for six months. Also, just even having a discussion about noting yourself as an insured was impossible in bar barrier to penetrate. They just didn't want to go there. So it was either a decision, either the government assisted us or else we wouldn't be there because um, yeah. they weren't going to come to the party. In fact, in 2013, VKI's position, because when you look at the Belgian law, um, the, uh, the Belgian Ministry of Science picks up liability uh, down to 10% uh, of the turnover of the institution. So. VKI's turnover was something like 12 million euros. So VKI was, was liable to one, for 1.2 million euros. We got to that workshop, and VKI's discussion was, how do we split the 1.2 million euros among all the participants? Mm. So yeah, it, the implication was that we were covered. Their, their defense ministry, uh, their, sorry, their science ministry was covering us anyway. So what is our big problem? So when we, when we clarified the issue and we said, look, you know, you're, because when we came back here, we understood this is not the way it works. Um, you know, it, fair enough. They're, they're, um, we can sign an agreement with VKI that they absorb our liability. Their the government absorbs their liability, but there's nothing that would stop their government coming and knocking on our government's door and say under these treaties that I showed before and saying pay up. Or in fact, um, the, the worst case is that if something happens, if every one of these nations is a launching state and the 
the entity that suffers the damage can pursue anybody, including Australia. And Australia doesn't have leverage to, to um, uh, go after anybody. So this is why you know, we, we had all these, for a small satellite provider, and this, this has played a, a big part in, in precipitating the reform, because we, you, you, cannot, you cannot hope to run your business unless you know, you've got help in that area. So. so I think during the period from 2014 to 2016, uh, I, I believe Helen found that, uh, that there was a change in approach in government and that the possibility of a, of a ministerial um, exemption was more likely than as appeared to be the case in 2014 when there was a lot of talk about getting the appropriate insurance. So it was in 2016 that uh, uh, the three universities were able to submit our application for a, uh, an overseas launch certificate and we, we were working within the current framework of the Space Activities Act and the regulations under it and they're very highly prescriptive although as Helen mentioned there is uh, ultimately a lot of ministerial discretion uh, about whether to grant the, uh, the exemption. So. The other thing that we sub the university submitted at the same time, and I, I'll mention this just, just for completeness, is that we also submitted an application um, to be declared a scientific or educational organisation. And uh, again, there's a lot of prescriptive uh, steps to, to, to go uh, through. Uh, but the benefit, of course, is that the application fee for the overseas launch certificate is $100 instead of $10,000. So. Um, that's obviously an avenue which uh, any of you in similar organisations can go through. And but the, the defence export control permit. Yes, that's that's an additional uh, area that uh, uh, we didn't need uh, for some of the satellites. But I think the Sydney University satellite and we did for satellites. the Kia three. Yeah, because yeah. of the both of our satellites yeah. did that. I think, look, uh, the, the point behind our, uh, this talk is to, to sort of give our experience a little bit, uh, you know, in the hope that you guys won't have to fall um, into the same traps. But uh, the other thing is that uh, Helen's mentioned uh, to the to, to the government for picking up their bit and, and uh, you know, uh, carrying out the review. Uh, things will probably be different. We're hoping that things will, will be different. Uh, but uh, at least in, since about 2015 or 2014, I think the, the, there were some changes and we started getting quite a bit of help, at least in, in, in getting under the current legislation the, uh, uh, our projects going. I think uh, we, we heard, heard the bell. Uh, are there any questions? I think the only other thing that we should acknowledge is that the review that Stephen has led has sort of triggered some greater awareness and discussion um, so people are much more aware of what their responsibilities are. They actually know there's a piece of legislation, they know who they have to talk to, and that's really great because this area is starting to become far more dynamic than it was. So the review will roll out and the submissions will be um, evaluated at between May and August. So by the end of the year or next year, we might um, start to see some, some further movement in the area. I might, I might, actually, could I, could I put a stop on the questions now um, because otherwise we won't get through the talks but we've, we've left 10 minutes at the end for questions so, so I'll save it up, hold, hold that thought. I didn't get to blow my vuvuzela. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's really fascinating for me and I hope I get to talk to you a little bit more about how that all panned out in, in practice. Um, it's a great segue because uh, um, Helen and I talk, and Elias talked about how helpful um, the, uh, the SLASO was, which is the Space Licensing and Safety Office, for those of you who don't know, um, otherwise known as the, the Space Coordination Office, depending on which bit of it you're looking at. Um, but we're very, very lucky to have Mark Todd here to uh, 